<laughs> okay, so welcome. Oh, Chuck, come on in. <laughs> there's, there's a spot. No, there isn't a spot there. Okay, so welcome to the annual Freudian lecture. Um, today we're going to be hearing from Tian Wan. I, hope, I think I got it right. Yeah. Uh, Tian was last year's recipient of the Ferdian Scholarship, and as our poster noted, um, Tian is a PhD candidate in agricultural economics. He's lectured at Saskatchewan Polytech Polytechnic, and is currently working for the Cooperative Development Foundation. And so for those of you who don't know, the CDF, their mission is to use the cooperative model to uh, achieve sustainable economic development in countries outside of Canada. So Tian is working, we were just talking about this a moment ago, mm. working actively, for example, in Africa, parts of Africa, to, to work with communities around, agricultural communities around this. So in a sense, I think Tian is a, is a great example of how important this scholarship is. Um, by supporting people like Tian on his journey, his academic journey, the scholarship makes it easier for students to imagine doing what Tian is doing, which is finding a career that consists of sharing his knowledge that he's acquired here and sharing with the broader world. And in so doing, I think he's actually helping the university achieve its vision, which is the university that the world needs, right? So that's, yeah. there's a nice tie in there. Um, from what I can tell, again, Tian's trajectory aligns nicely with the Ferdian's intent in the scholarship. Uh, the family was kind enough to share with me their fundraising letter that dated back to 2003. And from that letter, uh, the family set up the scholarship to honor two important parts of their father's legacy. First, his longtime commitment to cooperatives. As the family noted in their fundraising letter, um, Frederick John Hartley Ferdian was greatly influenced by growing up in a pioneering community where cooperation meant not only a way of life, but a necessary condition for life. And the second way it relates back to, Sian's work relates back to um, Fridian family scholarship, is that the family want to honor their father's close ties to the University of Saskatchewan. Um, he worked on campus with Agricultural Can Agriculture Canada for many years, and through that relationship with Agriculture Canada, as I understand, he formed bonds with students and faculty, and really was part of the community at the university. So really hitting both those marks, right? Working to, to kind of um, spread the cooperative uh, message, but also doing it in a way that's kind of anchored at the university. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Tian to take us through his talk. And uh, really looking forward to it, Tian. Thank you for making your way to Saskatoon. Thank Saskatoon. you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. It's my pleasure and honor to be here. Firstly, I want to thank Freedom family so much because this scholarship helped me a lot financially and spiritually, uh, encouraged me to, to study more and work more in the co-op area. Um, yeah, so my name is Tian Wan. I'm a co-op specialist in CDF Canada. Um, so just a little bit about, oh, by the way, I'm so happy to see so many old friends today. <laughs> it's, uh, Saskatoon is always my home. You know, Ottawa is good, but compared <laughs> with Saskatoon, you know, the land of the living sky, uh, well, both are good, but so, so a little bit more about CDF Canada. CDF Canada was founded in 1947. So basically, after the World War II, Canadian co-op uh, co sectors, uh, entrepreneurs, and uh, co-op guys feel it's important to not only develop co-ops in Canada, but kind of share the expertise and spirit to the developing countries. So that's why and when co-op uh, CDF was uh, founded. Um, Back to the presentations today, there will be three parts. Uh, background, the formula. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the formula I built uh, for the discussion with uh, domestic and inter international partners. And the third is how we can use the formula to apply to the international development, uh, co-op development in, international, uh, in developing countries. So the background. Uh, since I started to learn co-op, and especially after I worked for CDF Canada, <coughs> I heard two kinds of point of view, and those two kinds of point of view are conflicting with each other. The first is like co-op strong believers. So they believe that co-ops are, I, no problem. They believe that co-ops are good because co-ops are you know pro-social, co-ops are serving the members' uh, needs. Um, and some many government officials also share this kind of perspective, and they 
when, when we have discussion with them, they kind of feel confused because co-ops are so good. They don't understand why you know, f the, you know, farmers don't participate in the co-op or, or exit from the co-op. Um, they believe that the, 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 the failure or the, not quite popu the, 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 the lack of popularity of co-op is due to the lack of education and promotion. So nothing to do, nothing wrong with the co-ops just because of the lack of education and promotion. So this is the opinion uh, from the co-op believers. Another group of people, they ask, why co-ops are necessary? And if co-ops are so good, why people don't choose co-ops? You know, in this world, co-ops is the co-op sector is definitely not, not the dominant model, right? So they ask, you know, probably co-ops are not that good. So this is the answer in my heart for them. I, I didn't mention too much because I respect their opinion, but in my heart, I think co-op is a good model, but under some conditions. Um, co-op is an ideology, a value, a spirit. So basically, I heard a lot of presentations by um, social science scholars. They mentioned a lot of things about the value, but I think value itself is good, but it cannot be, it's not enough. So I think basically, like fundamentally, co-op is a business model involving cost-benefit analysis and decision-making with limited resources. Um, and it's important to understand in a scientific and rigorous way regarding when, why, and how co-op model could be useful. And without such understanding, it could be less effective and less focusing in decision-making uh, policy making, planning projects, and initi initi initiating co-op business. Uh, so that is why I kind of built this formula, because in the future I want to use this formula to discuss with uh, both domestic and international partners. So the first point of view, who believe co-op is not a good model, will lead to policy negligence. While the other perspective of co-op will lead to over-eager and inappropriate de deployment of cooperative model. And interestingly enough, those two policy trends exi exist at the same time in the same country, commonly. So the country promotes some policies really promoting co-ops, but at, this, at the same time, because they don't understand co-op model, sometimes their policy is kind of depressing the co-op development. So it is also important for CDF Canada because we are using the taxpayers' money, like founded by uh, uh, Global Affairs Canada, as well as donors, probably some of you are donors of CDF Canada. So we really want to make sure that our projects are not project-based. So af uh, after the ending of the project, the co-op we build could be sustainable in the long term rather than you know, just uh, four or five years uh, within the project. Um, and we, al we also want to help the partners and co-ops and policymakers in developing countries know what is the best strategy to, to build a, 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 a kind of a sustainable and viable co-ops. Uh, so that's why we think it's important to build this kind of strategy. Uh, so here's the objectives of this formula. Uh, to build an integrated understanding why members need and choose co-ops, but more importantly, when or why they do not need or choose co-ops. Um, then after the building of the formula, I try to find some evidence of, uh, from co-ops in Canada and then try to apply those uh, experience to developing countries. Uh, when it comes to the guidance for co-op development, everybody knows these seven principles, right? But it is, uh, seven principles is good, but it's not the best strategy in some circumstances. Because I guess seven principles are kind of summarized from years of experience. It's basically kind of a summary, a summary from practice. However, as uh, Bertrand uh, mentioned in uh, 20, uh, 2005, they need, to be more, they need to be made more coherent, coherent uh, philosophically, not just a list. They need to be connected up more clearly with cooperative business practices. The co-op business advantage has to be demonstrated. So basically, we need to link the principles, the seven principles, more logically with the real business cost-benefit analysis. So that's why I, I, that's the reason I built this formula. Um, this formula starts from Porter, the business uh, 
uh, his business research. So, so firstly, I want to try. I want to uh, try to define what is co-op success. Uh, the the theoretical foundation I use is the firm success defined by Porter. Uh, firm success is many uh, manifested in <coughs> attaining a competitive uh, position or a series of competitive positions that lead to superior and sustainable financial performance. So then I try to. So this is the model, basically. Uh, firm success uh, comes from the I can use this comes from the relative good position, comes from the sustainable competitive advantage, comes from other activities and drivers and initial conditions. So in this presentation, I I will just focus on these three steps. Uh, so. Just focus on the three steps. So here's the difference between investor-owned firms and cooperatives. So if we define firm success for investor-owned firms as profitability or share price, which is kind of a uh, kind of a discounted cash flow, uh, comes from the superior position of firms, which is a better position than other players comes from those two issues, whether it's lower cost than rivals <coughs> or the ability to to charge uh, a higher price, right? Now, if we want to define those three steps for co-ops, what could be the three steps for co-ops? In my opinion, you, you, can, you, you can have your own uh, kind of a definition for the three steps, uh, three steps for co-ops, but in my opinion, co-ops, the success of co-op should be creating member benefit, benefits with long-term financial sustainability. Mm -hmm. So you can, Creating, member, uh, creating benefits for the members is not enough, right? You can't share everything to the members while next year you don't have capital to run your business, right? So creating member benefits with long-term financial sustainability. Uh, then this uh, co-op success comes from the better position than IOFs, uh, investor-owned firms, and brokers. So members should be willing to choose you, the co-op, rather than the competitors. Then comes from then this comes from the competitive advantage, which is positive net benefit or utility member members receive by doing business with the co-op. So, which is kind of similar to uh, investor-owned firms, right? But kind of a, in a in a co-op perspective. So I just I kind of just uh, transform this one sentence to a mathematical equation, which is this. So members should, the member, members should get, so the members, the benefit members get from co-op compared with a competitor should be higher than the cost increase, right? So for example, if I do a business with a co-op, I earn $2 more than doing business with a company, but I spend one dollar more as my cost, which is okay, right? Because the increase of the benefits is higher than increase of the cost. Then, so this is just the expect, uh, expansion of the first formula. In, in many cases, if there's no competitors at all, the co-ops just need to make, it, make that happen. The benefit doing business with co-op is higher than the cost doing business with co-op, right? So the net benefit or the utility is higher than zero. So those are the variables that I want to present to you before we get into the formula so that you won't get lost uh, in the boring mathematics. Um, B with co-op means the benefit co-op's products or service generates for the members. So the benefit member get from doing business with co-op. Similar, B with competitor means the benefit the member or the farmer or the consumer get from doing business with the competitor, uh, co-op's competitor. The, the CT co-op, T means transaction, transaction costs. So CT co-op means members transaction costs by uh, buying products or services from the co-op, which is not included, sorry, not included in the sales price. So basically if, if I want to get the service from the co-op, I need to drive 10 kilometers to the co-op facility this is not included in the price, but this is the cost for the farmers, for, for the members. Similarly, for the, t, uh, the transaction cost 
to do business with the competitors. Pi co-op reserved is the profit co-op reserved rather than uh, sharing, like giving back to the farmers. Pi competitor is the profit of the the profit of uh, uh, the profit of the uh, co-op's competitor. C co-op is the operating or is the cost of the co-op to provide the product or service. C competitor is the cost for uh, co-op's competitor. Uh, any any questions about all those variables before we uh, move on? <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, two more. R co-op is the revenue. So so R is specifically for marketing co-ops. R is the uh, R co-op is the revenue the marketing co-op generate um, by selling or uh, selling the processed or non-processed uh, farmers' products. R competitors the revenue uh, the co-op's competitor generates by selling the products. So, so this is this is the formula we, we just saw, right? And we so for for uh, so for for members as buyers, we keep this and change, but we kind of do some transformation of this part. Um, C with co-op, which is the cost doing business with co-op, right? Include two parts: the transaction costs, which is before you can do business with the co-op, you need to drive to the facility and stuff. P co-op is the price you pay to the co-op. Remember, it's the members as buyers, so basically consumers co-op. Um, so we transform this C with co-op to T to C trans, uh, to transaction costs plus the price, similar for, for this, for the competitor. And then we transform this part. So P, the price the, the members pay uh, to the co-op equals to this. Why? Because if you think about the profit of uh, the co-op, the profit is the price we receive, right? The, pr the, the, the money rece they receive from farmers minus their cost. So profit equals to price minus cost. So the price equals to profit plus the cost. So you don't need to understand this formula too much because we, we will focus on the application part. Uh, but basically we can transform this net benefit of members into what the co-op need to consider in their operation. So the first part, more utility. So those are the four potential competitive advantage that co-op could generate for the members. First, more utility. Whether it's accurate need discovery or flexibility or niche products, which is quite reasonable, right? Because for example, if, you, if there's only one restaurant in the town and some of guys like salty ones, some, some of the guys don't like salty ones. The best option for the restaurant is to cook some unsalty dishes while put some salt in front of the table, right? Then you can add salt if, if you want. However, so this is a strategy for many big companies because they can't, they are not able to coordinate different kinds of needs. However, if the co-op in a, in a community, if they know their members need very well, very well, they can just produce very flexible and nature products. So this is kind of the one possible, one potential competitive advantage that, that co-op could have. The second one is uh, trans about transaction cost, which is the convenience for the members to reach the products or service. The third one is share more profit generated from the business to members compared with competitors because, you know, uh, investor-owned firms basically share price, share profit to the, the shareholders rather than the members. Um, and business efficiency. This is important for all the business, uh, not only a co-ops. So you can see from the four parts, it's good for co-ops to, to, oh, sorry, to increase, uh, to increase the, this one, right? To reduce this one, to reduce, sorry, to, yeah, to increase this one, to reduce this one, to reduce this one, to reduce this one. But only one issue here. Co-op may need to, to, to reserve some profits in order to increase this, reduce this, reduce this. You know what I mean? So basically, just from the formula, it's good to share all the profits to, to, the, to the members, 
all, like uh, reserving nothing for the co-op. However, in order, in order to maintain sustainable success, sometimes it's good to reserve some profit. As long as that investment is, is, it will be used sufficient, uh, efficiently for, for those three variables. So the num number five issue will be reinvest decisions and business strategies. Uh, Uh, so for members as sellers, we just talk about the consumers co-op. Now we kind of talk about the marketing co-ops. Now we, we keep this part. Oh. So we kind of uh, keep this part unchanged. We kind of uh, transform uh, this part. So the, the benefit members could get from the co-op is what? It's basically the price they get, right? The on, the, this is the only part they can, the, the, they can, the, the benefit they can get from the co-op. It's the how much the co-op pay them to buy their products, and then this price could be transformed to this, which is also uh, pretty clear and logical because if you transform this a little bit, the profit of the co-op equals to the revenue, which is the, the processed product that co-ops sell to the market, minus the co-op's cost, which is part of the co-op's cost, minus the other part of the cost, which is the price they pay to the farmers, right? Uh, then we transform this formula, and then P equals to this. So, so similarly, we put them into four uh, expressions for four parts. So this, these are the possible potential competitive advantages for, uh, uh, for uh, marketing co-ops. More revenue, no matter uh, through market power or quality control or brand or value-added processing. Convenience to sell or deliver products. This is the same, right, with a, uh, with a consumer's co-op. Share to members more profit generated from the business, also the same with the consumer's co-op. Uh, business efficiency, also the same with the uh, consumer's co-op. And then you need, to make de you need to make very strategic decisions in, in terms of occupying some real profits for the future uh, development of the co-op. So except the second one, the other four are the same with the consumer's co-op. Then we kind of conclude the potential competitive advantage or competitive disadvantage for cooperatives. More utility, more revenue <coughs> for marketing co-ops, uh, more convenience, distribute more profit to members, business efficiency. Um, and if you want to uh, reserve profits rather than giving to the farmers, you need to make sure that the profit reserved will be used in a good place which requires good governance and management. So probably we, uh, we have time, we can talk about La Coffee, uh, FCL, and uh, Saskatchewan Whitpool, who are good examples and bad examples um, in terms of governance and management. So kind of a discussion of the formula. Uh, so by breaking down the member's net benefit, the formula transformed the member's choice and benefit to the components of co-op's capacity and their strategic planning. So we start from the member's issue, member's net benefit. But in the end, we transform it into the co-op's decision making. Uh, so what co-ops need to pay attention to. Um, a dynamic circle could be drawn from a showing the formula indicated competitive advantages that could potentially create net benefits for the members, which is this. Uh, so firstly, accurate discovery of members' needs coordinating the needs and matching to the choice of pro providing niche products or service or the value adding uh, processing or marketing. And you, after you make the decision which service or product to produce or provide, you also need the capacity, uh, capability to provide this service. You can't say I want this, but you don't have ability to produce it, right? So you need the capa uh, capability as well as efficiency to provide the service. Also, the convenience for members to reach, to, to reach or receive the products or service. And after doing the business, 
the co-op get some profits, and now you need to retain profits for the member for 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 investments um, for the future needs based on the needs and to strengthen the capacity, the efficiency, and used to com to communicate with members for their evaluation feedback. And after retain the profit, then the co-op share profit to the to the members and then communicate and uh, get feedback and evaluation, and based on which co-op get updated and changed needs, and then uh, back and forth. So co-op do not need to have competitive advantage in all the sales, because it's kind of a, it's a, it's a adding game, right? So as long as the net competitive, so the overall competitive advantage is is good, then it's good. You don't have to be good in all the cells, in every cell. And these com this competitive advantages or disadvantages can explain most emergence, development, success, and failure of co-ops in Canada, as well in, in many developed countries, and could give uh, guide, uh, guidance to the co-op movement in, de in developing countries. So, so this is from uh, the Eswatini delegation that we host uh, two weeks ago. Uh, basically, the, uh, Global Affairs Canada founded a, a visit of the uh, agricultural department officials from Eswatini to, to learn the experience of Canadian agriculture and co-ops. This, this is the challenges they mentioned during the visit. They mentioned that, you know, the challenges faced by the ag agriculture sector in their country uh, are low production and product, uh, productivity, high cost of production inputs, poor access to finance and other production resources, climate-related issues, lack of uh, market access or market facilitation. So except this uh, uh, climate-related issues, all the other issues are similar to the challenges Canadian agriculture faced one century ago. And 100 years ago, during that period of time, we saw a huge movement of co-ops, agricultural co-ops in Canada. So if they are facing, if, if those countries are facing similar challenges that Canada used to face, we probably should you know, expect a co-op movement in those countries too, right? because they are facing the same similar challenges. However, it's not the case. So this, this, inform, this uh, information is from another, you know, uh, 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 from, from, from other delegations in, uh, from developing countries collected from a uh, partners forum. So they mentioned the problems, the challenges for co-ops, especially agriculture co-ops in their countries. I kind of, uh, put them into three categories based on member own, member control, and mem member benefit. So in terms of member own uh, and participation, so the inability to pay membership fee. So basically they, they don't have money to pay, to pay the membership fee. So they, they won't participate. Side selling to the brokers uh, or middlemen or uh, other businesses. Bad reputation of co-ops. So I didn't write down the name here Oh, it's recorded, so uh, probably I shouldn't uh, mention the, which country it is, but that guy just mentioned there's a, the, the, the reputation of co-ops in that country was terrible because co-ops were built just for uh, government subsidy without the real business. So, um, so every time when, when people talk about co-op, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's another name of fraud. You know. uh, member control, poor governance, broker control the co-op, government interference on co-op apex and co-ops. Members' lack of uh, interests of, uh, and knowledge, etc. Member benefit, unfair taxation, weak or no business capacity, uh, capability, no access to capital, technology, cheap input, market, and profit occupied by, by brokers. So even though the, 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 the agriculture f in their countries face the similar challenges as Canada used to, to face, however, because of the People don't know co-op quite well. They don't know how to make the best policy, focusing on the real problems. Their co-ops are not developing very uh, healthily. 
uh, oh, sorry. I should uh, move on more quickly than expected. So, so those are the experience and lessons we can learn for developing countries, which is kind of a, just a story telling based on the previous uh, formula, right? So the competitive, the, the possible, po uh, the potential competitive advantage number one is to provide product or service with higher utility with accurate need discovery, flexibility, and energy products. So this is the experience from Canada. We saw some co-ops that are initiated due to this reason, due to this competitive advantage, local food grocery co-op, organic food co-op, the Siembra worker co-op, which is a co-op to market uh, uh, fair trade products from international, uh, from uh, developing countries. The workers want to work at the same time embracing the you know, pro-social or international cooperation value. Credit unions with, with flexible loan products. Renewable energy co-op. So those are the co-ops initiated for this reason. But those co-ops are, co are face, facing challenges um, because the coordination of different needs uh, is, is more difficult when co-op get bigger. Uh, those are the theories, uh, like cognitive li uh, limitation over confidence, strategic interdependence by Murray Fulton, and life cycle theory by Cook. So uh, kind of could explain you know, the difficulty when co-op get bigger. Um, and niche products are harder to find with economic development. So basically, you know, business have taken advantage of all the gaps in the market. It's harder for co-ops to find the niche product. For developing countries, the challenge it's another issue, it's another thing. So for them, they, they kind of worry less about the competition, but they kind of feel hard to know their needs. They have needs, no doubt about that, but they don't know the needs. Um, so what we commonly do for international assisting projects is that the teams go to the field or employ a consulting team to analyze what they need. And then we discuss what they need and then we give them the support. There's a problem with this approach, which is teaching them fish, which is, so that approach is kind of give them a fish, but what is more important is teaching them how to fish. Uh, a volunteer, which is Murray here. So he, we, uh, we had a discussion about the, you know, the challenges in our projects. So he told me, do you want to tell the audience by yourself? Oh, well, yeah, the, what I found, uh, I like uh, Chen's uh, approach. I saw brand new Massey tractors and brand new state-of-the-art uh, seeders, and I saw the A groups saying they'd improved the seeding. The guy was on the field hoeing. I got a picture of him hoeing in a field with the tractor sitting there because they didn't know how to set it up. And that was a three-point hitch. They didn't know what that was. There was the A guys had given it to them. And then they were seeding, and they had a better stick. And the ladies were going behind, and they were going to compete with Cargill. And the marketing plan was, we're going to compete. And they had about 300 bushels of corn. Yeah. And it was really tough. And some of the A people thought that was a good thing. And I'm sitting there and saying, that, that doesn't even fill my truck. And I can't compete with Cargill. So that was what we found, that there was a real disconnect. Yeah. They had a really good... Uh, storage building, but they carried the stuff in with on their backs. They didn't know what a grain auger was, and you couldn't get at it with the truck because they put the ramp right up against. I got a picture of it too. They put the ramp right up against the wall, so you couldn't get in with a bicycle. So they had a great door and everything, but it's just really bad business planning. Yeah, so like they do have needs, but they don't have the the knowledge or skills to analyze their needs or realize their needs. And most importantly, when the project ends, do they have the ability to adjust the, the, the market change and the, the, the business environment change to, to, to analyze their updated needs? Um, it's something that the interna international assistance project should be uh, concerned about. So second, uh, competitive advantage, enjoy more revenue of the supply chain. Uh, the new generation co-ops is uh, definitely a very good example when farmers want to occupy more, more uh, revenue from the supply chain, so they kind of buy the delivery rights, they deliver their products to the 
processing facilities the invested as a member, and then in that way they don't need to just market their raw products. They can invite, they can uh, pro market their processed products with higher uh, market value. Uh, La Coffee, the the market their pork depending on, on the country needs. So basically, they market the products to China, uh, the the common products. They market the pork to U.S. Like basically transport the, the pig to the U.S. Uh, to uh, to their uh, uh, meat processing facilities. However, they import they ex export a kind of a I don't know how to translate, but kind of a snowflake meat. Do you know what I mean? Like the the the, the red meat with very balanced and average the, like a fat like snowflakes on the meat, which is high level, high premium, very good. Uh, quality product to to Japan because Japanese people like those kind of high quality products. So so that's what uh, that's a model of how co-ops could do to gain more revenue of the value chain. Sunkist and BC Tree Growers. Um, so especially the co-ops like Sunkist are called the uh, Sapiro Two co-ops, uh, who kind of uh, help farmers get a better market price as they are the industry or industrial monopoly power. So some cases, the number one, probably one of the, the only one, or, but definitely the number one orange, citrus, uh, lemon uh, producer or association in US. So because of the market power, they can increase the, the revenue. The challenges are is uh, the investment decisions and coordination of different needs when co-ops get bigger is difficult, similar to the, the previous uh, slide. And globalization, globalization and competition uh, make make it harder to to uh, for co-ops to, to to create more avenue. For developing countries, again, it's a kind of a different story. Um, they don't have like this is the concern I heard most from the international delegation. They said they basically have have no market access or the capability to dry store or process the product. That make it make co-op uh, kind of a tool for the the middleman or for the uh, for for the other for for other business, uh, just as a tool to organize farmers to provide the raw products without the the ability to market high like to to go higher into the value chain. So this is the the problem for our projects, in, including CDF. So we focus too much. Which is good, but not enough. We, we focus quite a lot to the uh, production, productivity, and quality part, you know. But we kind of lack the, the the focus on the marketing part, which is kind of ridiculous because no matter how much the productivity and quality you can improve, if that cannot be transformed into market revenue, this is nothing. All the profit, all the benefits will be just uh, trans will be just flowed into the middleman or the, the private business pockets. But we also have some uh, good example like Norandino is a Peru cacao and coffee co-op who export high organic products uh, like uh, high level organic products to to Canada, U.S. and European Union through uh, like within the for, uh, fair trade network. So the price for them, the revenue for them, is pretty high because they enjoy the price premium. Um, so this is kind of a good example, but but they can achieve this because they have international partners. So in the future, in our projects, we should really try to uh, to connect the local uh, to connect the local co-ops with all those kind of international partners, give them the market access. So competitive disadvantage number three. Oh, sorry, competitive advantage number three: convenient access to pro to product and services. Uh, this is the reason why a lot of co-ops were initiated in, in Canada last century. This is kind of a this is called North One Co-op, which is the the, the local uh, geographical uh, monopoly power. So basically, think about that. If if you are the only store in this community, like the co-op store in Corner Gas, uh, sorry, Gas Corner Corner Corner. What, what's the, fa the the popular TV series in Saskatchewan? Corner Gas. Yeah. Corner Gas. So the I heard they mentioned the co-op store quite a lot of times because I guess that is the only store in that area. So, so those are the co-ops. Those are the, this is the reason why so many co-ops initiated because they provide convenient access to 
to the to uh, to the farmers to, to to the to the consumers or producers. Uh, examples are the local grocery co-ops or grain handling and marketing co-ops. And FCL's first uh, refinery, right? Uh, give the farmers easy access to the fuel. Uh, Sanabar cheese, uh, which is initiated to process local milk to cheese. Those kind of agricultural product, uh, those kind of agricultural co-ops are popular if the products are perishable, because the farmers need to need a safe, uh, need a secured place to process their products before it goes to bed. The challenges are right now is you know the infra infrastructure infrastructure is better internet is better you know call you know uh, Amazon Best Buy you know you don't need to go to the store you can order online um, and with globalization like uh, Walmart Loblaw Superstore they, they 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 get into all the communities. Um, talking about Loblaw, do you do you know that Loblaw is actually a co-op guy? So Loblaw used to be the lead, used to be, uh, Mr. Loblaw used to lead the consumers co-op movement in Ontario, but he failed. And he summarized the practice and experience into, like I put it into his own business. And then his own business is very successful, uh, Loblaw and Superstore, this uh, um, grocery chain. But he, is, uh, origi he was originally a co-op guy. So those are just some pictures. Uh, the first uh, refinery of uh, FCL in close to Regina. So for developing countries, the convenience, in terms of this competitive advantage, the main issue is about the middleman. So all the convenience that the co-op can provide could be provided by the middleman. The middlemen know the farmers, middlemen have uh, kind of a many years uh, connection with the farmers. So if the, you have middlemen in the community, you don't have motivation to initiate and invest to your own co-op. Um, and especially when there are both co-ops and middlemen, members tend to side sell to the middlemen. This is really, really not a good thing, especially when the co-op is in the initial stage. Farmers don't have the patience to wait for the co-op to learn how to manage, learn how to make, uh, to l learn how to accumulate business resources before they could be profitable, right? So in the early years, if farmers side sell to the to the broker, to the middleman, then the the co-op may fail within just uh, sev several years after initiation. But they don't realize that co-op is long term, uh, co-op's long term contribution is a yard stake. So it's similar to the story we heard these days. Calgary Co-op, uh, the relationship between Calgary Co-op uh, and the FCL, right? So Co-op is a yardstick, it's a long-term yardstick. You might get some benefit short, uh, in the short term, but what about in the long term? So it's important for Co-ops to provide more convenience to the farmers. Uh, the Co-ops need to, needs to invest the infra infrastructures like storage and systems, design the product or service delivery strategy, so this, is, this comes from the example I, uh, I learned from China, which is a duck co-op in China. So they basically, when they sell the, the duck feed or duck medicine to the farmers, they calculate based on how mu how, how the, the amount they sell to the farmer and the farmer's uh, production scale. They can get a pretty, pretty accurate uh, calculation on when the farmers need to buy again. So one day or two days before they need to buy, they call the farmers, do you need uh, to buy products? They say yes. And then they, they sell the products, the, 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 the duck feed and medicine to the farmers directly. They transport to the farmers. They don't charge farmers anything at the very beginning, but they kind of help the farmers to market the duck. And in the end, they deduct the cost of uh, duck medicine and duck feed from the, the revenue. So farmers, basically it's so easy for farmers. So this is something that you know, other co-ops in developing countries can do to win the battle with the middlemen. Uh, so competitive advantage number four, profit retained by members, which, is pure, which is, shouldn't be a competitive disadvantage, it should be a pure advantage, right? Because no business models other than co-ops will share benefit with members, right? 
Um, so this, this is the reason why some co uh, consumers co-ops were initiated in the early 1900s, especially in the Depression and wartime, because you know, people just cannot afford some basic products like sugar, bread, um, you know, some, some uh, very basic products. So they, they kind of uh, build the, uh, uh, the consumers co-op to pro provide basic products for themselves. Uh, the Rockdale uh, Consumers Co-op is, is initiated for this reason. Housing co-ops. I, I forget to att uh, attach the data. Uh, Tim Ross uh, the other day shared the data, uh, kind of a comparison, the, 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 the rent, the, the, the rent uh, if you are a, cons uh, a, ho uh, a, a housing co-op member, uh, compared with if you rent from the uh, uh, private landlords. So there's a huge difference in terms of the rent. Credit unions uh, also share some of the profits to the members. The challenge is, is that the market competition drive the price and profit premium down so that the room that co-ops can share more profits is narrowed compared with the competitors. Uh, the, the, the example is the credit unions that Mark Andre the other day talked about. So uh, credit unions, because they're too small, they, they feel difficult to, compare, uh, to, to compete with the large uh, commercial banks. Uh, yeah, so furthermore, the discussion on profit sharing is built on the assumption that co-ops could be equally cost efficient and be able to create equal revenue compared with competitors, both of which are not easy to achieve. Uh, so Saskatchewan, we pull. Uh, so those are the two remarks from Scott Bandy, a former CEO of FCL. So he mentioned the reason many co-ops are founded is for to, to, to retain generating profit and putting it back into the local shareholders, right? To, to, to occupy more profit to the local residents. So for developing countries, the main issue is governance. So probably if you achieve all the competitive advantages we just discussed, you generate some profits, can we make sure that the profits are shared by the members rather than a small group of people? Um, we heard, a, we kind of heard a question from a international delegation last month. They asked how to deal with the problem of board directors unwilling to exist, which is kind of very rare in Canada because we we kind of uh, have a very good bylaw, and members can elect their uh, board directors. But as a person from, uh, from China, from developing countries, I know this is a really, really real problem. If you consider the, the, the local social cultural uh, contest. Um, and even though they have good bylaw, the local leaders and the middlemen can control the co-op in various ways and you know, enjoy the profit, uh, sh uh, occupy the profit in, in various ways. So two ways I found. Uh, one way is to market their products as a, as a preference. So basically they say, you know, we have limited marketing capacity, we can only market this much, but they, they market their products as a preference. Secondly, which is also very interesting, I kind of admire their, their, you know, their wisdom. You know. the, the leader initiated a co-op and a company. So the, the, company, uh, uh, the company partner with the co-op. And the co-op sell product, the raw products to, uh, sorry, the co yeah, the co-op uh, the, sell the, the raw products to the company. The company pro uh, process and market the, the, you know, the high value products to the market. So in this way, the company can kind of, kind of uh, uh, decrease, uh, reduce the price for the co-op so that they can occupy more profit. Legally, it's totally okay because the co-op still share 80% profit with the, with the farmers. However, from another, in a, in a very flexible way, the leader occupy most of the profits. And when making policies and planning projects, that's what we can learn from, from the lessons. It is important to remember that the training and the capacity building should be de delivered to the, to the farmers, to the grassroots farmers, 
rather than the leaders and middlemen. So what I worried about our current contract, uh, con con uh, projects is that because we, we have difficulty to reach the, to, to the community because we, we, we are not the local residents, it's so hard for us to, you know, to have contact with all the local guys. So we kind of find the local partners to deliver our uh, supports to the farmers. But if they get more knowledge, more skills, more man man management cap uh, capabilities, what if they use this power, this knowledge, to hold up the farmers in the future? This is something um, uh, we, sh we should be uh, considered. So in the future, we should really just give the uh, training and support directly to the farm farmers rather than you know, the middle guys. Uh, so that they could, the farmers could have knowledge and skills in doing business and super, uh, supervise the management and control their own business. <clears throat> and when government gives subsidies, the democratic governance structure should be an important criterion. Um, what I heard from the de delegation from Mongolia, from Indonesia, from, um, from Eswatini, they kind of give a lot of uh, financial support to the co-ops. However, you know, because of this, a lot of empty co-ops were initiated. Um, so the financial support, the, the taxpayers' money, haven't been used to used in a very efficient way. Uh, so facing all the challenges, all the four challenges uh, regarding the four competitive, uh, number one to number four competitive advantage, uh, the number five is especially important because the market competition kind of uh, reduce the competitive, uh, competitive advantage number one to number four for the co-ops. So the co-ops should really try hard to to uh, increase their efficiency and to make very careful and cl uh, smart strategic decision making so that they could figure out what their future new competitive advantage could be and to, to strengthen those competitive advantage. Um, I think I talked too much, uh, but here are some uh, good comparison in the future we can talk about. So how FCL, how Le Cofeli learned lessons from uh, Saskatchewan with Pool. So I talked with Pierre uh, Philippe from Le, uh, Le Cofeli. They mentioned they, they really take it seriously uh, of the lessons from uh, Saskatchewan with Pool. They even changed their bylaw uh, because the failure of Saskatchewan with Pool. So, so for developing countries in terms of cost efficiency and investment decisions, several issues. Labor is definitely a competitive advantage because their labor is pretty cheap. Uh, capital, it depends. For some countries, they provide low interest uh, loans to the co-ops, like China and Mongolia. For some countries, it's really hard to get uh, cheap loans. Uh, technology and management, uh, I'm just going to quickly go through this. Um, based on the information we get from the partners, this is the, the major challenge in turn, uh, like a developing con uh, the, the co-ops co in developing countries face. Financial literacy and bookkeeping. So think about that. When we talk about cost efficiency, the first step you could do, you, sh you, you need to do, is to know how much is the cost, right? Where is the cost from? Like if you don't know where the cost from, if you don't have a clear bookkeeping, how could you analyze? and forecast and make uh, smart decisions to, to, uh, to achieve cost efficiency. Oh. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much. So, so any- we have some time for questions. Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to go first? So, Sam, maybe I'll start. <laughs> so, it seems to me like there, there are some pretty significant challenges here for, in these developing countries. It seems almost um, insurmountable. I mean, what do you think about, uh, when you think about these, these efforts to develop co-ops, in terms of, you know, if you don't have the basic educational foundations, like you were talking about just yeah. a moment ago, um, you've got corruption problems, you have a perhaps an unfavorable tax yeah. policy regime, you have an unfavorable policy regime generally. How do you, how do you, 
overcome those things because arguably at least some of that wasn't so much at yeah. play in Canada when these things were getting off the ground. Yeah. It's 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 kind of a it's kind of a easy to learn the business sense, but it's hard to change the social norm, like a sense of democracy. I, I feel when I when I did uh, case studies in China, um, I feel it's hard to to really promote the real co-ops in China because one, if you promote the pure democracy, then the elites don't have any motivation to take the responsibility to put their knowledge, to put their capital into the community to build a co-op. But if you allow this to happen, then the co-op cannot be the real co-op. So I guess, uh, yeah, I, but I, I don't know what's the best solution, but, but for, for, uh, when it comes to the China experience, I guess it's step by step. So firstly, you let the co-ops to be initiated. You you let you 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 kind of ask them to build the, the successful business, and farmers learn from the business. Farmers get more knowledge, and then you talk about the democracy. So it's hard to talk about democracy before talking about uh, business. Uh, so it's a long-term process. I guess probably 50 years, 100 years. But but we we still we we have already seen some very good examples in developing countries. Even though I mentioned something not quite uh, positive in the countries I mentioned, uh, Mongolia, Malawi, Indonesia. But I, I forgot to mention they also made a lot of progress. So, you know, back to the first slide, uh, co-op skeptics, skeptics and co-op uh, believers. I guess um, good side and bad side. So, but no matter what, we need to go forward. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, First of all, I think, you know, uh, I was a bit confused to understand, like, uh, you talked about other values of becoming part of a co-op, but then when you're for, you know, uh, developing the formula, uh, it looks a little like return on investment kind of model, mm -hmm. like financial return and the other costs associated to it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you think that, the, you know, the other maybe residuals or, or social factors or values could have been coming to the model? Yeah. That's one question. Uh, secondly, you know, if you are looking at co-ops, I think one of the advantages, if the people who are becoming part of the co-ops are all kind of agricultural people, uh, they definitely bring some of, you know, the, the knowledge on the whole sector. Uh, while you are doing another shareholders business where people are just coming with money, not always with the business expertise, right? So that's another competitive advantage you might consider. Mm -hmm. The final comment is, uh, you partly mentioned about the bad governance, but I would also like to mention about, you know, the whole, the, the nature of business in the capitalistic world. Uh, it is said that everything is fair in love and work, but nowadays everything has become fair in love and in business. Yeah. And businesses are not always fair in terms of manipulating, you know, the market. Yeah. Or, you know, even driving the government, the corruption issues. It's a part of the governance issue you mentioned. Yeah. So I guess that's another disadvantage because in a cooperative where people are trying to come together and share their wisdom and expertise and money to earn some money, yeah. uh, they are competing with some entities which are not operating the similar governance and decision making process. Yeah. So they might feel more vulnerable becoming part of cooperative than you know, investing in their business maybe. Yeah. yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, your first question is about, sorry. So the, your third question, I guess there's a, uh, governance model. The first one is about the model. So it's the, you yeah. know, do you talked about other social returns and values of becoming part of course, but yeah. then eventually you ended up on the financial yeah. <laughs> aspect of it. Yeah. The this pre uh, this uh, report or presentation is focused on is uh, de developed in an economic perspective mm -hmm. because I I heard s uh, a lot of people talk about the social values, um, you know. F F not from an economic perspective, which I think is pretty good, but I think uh, for me the thing I want to do is you know purely develop develop a formula from economic uh, perspective so that people know how to make how to make members make money, and I think for developing countries this is even more important because you can't well it's important to to promote uh, local solidarity you know. Uh, care in the community, cooperation, but for people living under uh, poverty, 
they care mostly about money. They need to survive. They need to make money in order to survive. So I'm not saying that social values are not important. They're super important. But there, there are so many noises. So right now, I just want to focus on the economic, uh, ana uh, uh, economic analysis perspective. But you are, you are right. Uh, other perspectives are, uh, are, are also very, very important. Or maybe using a return on investment model. Right? Pardon me? Or using the return on investment model that business use, right? Yeah. Like how much money I can gain by getting involved into this. Yeah. Wasn't that an option? Well, if you have uh, financial literacy, you have the knowledge skills, yes. But that model is basically, in my opinion, used to, 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 uh, to attract investors uh, from the outside. So I show you in internal the potential internal uh, uh, return. The rate could be like five percent, which is higher than the bank rate. So you know, uh, invest money to our project and stuff. But I guess for for farmers, especially for uh, farmers in rural, uh, remote rural communities, they have to build a co-op because they have no service. So in that uh, in that sense. The return is not that important, but the relative competitive advantage is important. Yeah. So, your your third question is about the uh, governance model, right? So we have the so-called multi-stakeholder governance model, um, which is pretty good because the co-op can get uh, knowledge and skills from government, from NGOs, from farmers, from academia, like CDF. Did. So, so collect the information and expertise to guide the future strategic making of the co-op. Um, but one thing, like one difference between, like one competitive disadvantage for co-op is you don't have an indicator to monitor the performance of the uh, management teams. So for, for, for private firms, the profit. For, for, share ho for, for uh, some listed uh, uh, companies, it's the share price. When it comes to um, principal agent issues, princi principal agent problems, if the information asymmetry is pretty high, you need something to know the information. For listed, uh, for, for listed companies, the share price is the information. So, so, so shareholders know, you know the, price, the share price go down, you are not doing a good job, fire you. But for, share, for, for the multi-state, for, for co-ops, members don't have a good tool to, to monitor. So you mentioned, yes, uh, uh, co-op has some uh, advantage in terms of the governance because it can collect, informa uh, collect information from different perspectives. But at, it, at the same time, the coordination is hard. The efficiency, the monitoring, the, the control issues, those kind of issues are, are the, the, bad, uh, the bad parts. Uh, the second, what's your second question? No, the, the second <laughs> was more like a comment uh, okay. talking about the competitive advantage that co-ops might have. Yeah. So okay, thank you. If I, if I may, I was wondering, you talked a little bit about failure rate of co-ops, or co-ops failing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a valid thing to look at. I was wondering, though, whether you'd considered sort of the comparison between uh, private yeah. and cooperative failure rates. Yeah. Because you, when you look around at private businesses, particularly small ones, the, yeah. the failure rate's very high. Yeah. Turnover is huge. Yeah. So it, are you being a little unfair? I mean, it is, isn't it a little unfair to think that co-op should always succeed? That, that it depends on the people, it depends on the model, it depends on the product, mm -hmm. all sorts of things. And so um, I was just wondering whether you, whether you sort of yeah. looked at that more broadly to look at yeah. success and failure. Okay. Um, so the, co the failure rate for co-ops is just half of the private firms in Canada. I, I don't have the data for other countries, but for Canada, the failure rate is, exact, uh, is, is uh, significantly lower than lower. other type of business. Um, so, yeah, you are right, because I guess it's back to uh, uh, the gentleman's uh, previous question. The reason, I guess, because co-op, uh, the failure rate for co-op is low, because at the very beginning it can get information and knowledge from a group of people, rather than, you know, an overconfident, passionate, young entrepreneur, you know, especially when at the starting stage of the business. 
that is for, for, for Canadian co-ops. And um, all those competitive advantage um, or disadvantage is kind of a, just a pure theoretical analysis. So you, you can see prior to the advantage, I add a bracket, uh, put DIS into it. So it could be disadvantage, it could be advantage. So what I'm thinking to do using this formula is to see how we can even lower the failure rate by uh, you know, understand co-op's model better, especially for developing countries. Um, yeah, I mean, related to, to that, I mean, it depends what measurement tools you're going to bear, right? Yeah. Uh, were you at all uncomfortable that you were excluding from your model so many factors that are regarded as important to co-ops uh, and that new accounting and yeah. economic modeling is trying to take account of? Yeah. So, you know, if you think of the work being done at St. Mary's uh, yeah. at the centre there, um, co-op accounting and reporting, uh, the attempt is to bring in the things that you've bracketed out yeah. in your model. Yeah, thank you for this question. Really good question. Uh, I read the, the model uh, like two months ago uh, by St. Mary University. Really good um, like, a, like a evaluation model. So. That's why I didn't call my thin a model. This is just a formula given. So what I'm trying to do is simplify things because the question I heard from people are so conflicting and they just need some a basic uh, like understanding related to business itself. So I didn't, but you are definitely right. So many uh, uh, other factors should be considered to measure whether the co-op is successful or not um, other than pure economic uh, factors. Um, but again, I'm just trying to simplify things uh, rather than, you know, uh, expand things. I want to I pick up on those things because I think it's a really interesting thread. What, one thing about what Tian's doing is, is in the developing country context and, and this funding from the federal government and from, and so there's this kind of, we want to see these things work absolutely and failure is a bad thing because it means the funding's going to dry up. So <laughs> this is, I mean, I think yeah. that, I understand why he's doing, I'm on the board of CDF, and so if we have a failure, that means we're set with Global Affairs Canada and asking them for money, it's like, this is a really bad thing, it's a really bad thing. And so that's why we obsess about the, the, the success failure from the economic perspective, because yeah. that's what they're looking at. And, so you know? Yeah, and when it comes to social economy and new economy, I'm, I'm pretty positive about the trend in Canada and in Europe. I'm not sure about US, because US still a capitalist, uh, system, but for Canada and the US it's definitely a trend because um, people in Canada and e, uh, sorry, in Canada and EU, so people in Canada and EU in those developed countries, we care happiness and value more than just money. So my wife talked with me, uh, it's kind of a off uh, topic, but my, my wife uh, has a colleague uh, work as a manager in, I shouldn't this is personal information. As a manager of a fan <laughs> who earned like a uh, hundred k or a hundred k per year, who who quitted uh, his job and joined RBC, and he said, you know, I just so my wife was like, you you make so much money and you you have a, crest, a successful career, why you quit your job? He said, I'm not happy. I'm too busy. I want to save time for my leisure time. So this is something that. My friends in China started, started to learn, and this is something that many develop, developing countries don't know because it's just a Maslow like a tr triangle, right? You have different layers of needs. For Canada and EU, for those countries, I guess in the future, when it comes to the niche products, the, the, the flexible needs, there's a big room for the development of co-ops because really co-ops can provide something other than uh, economic profits, about values, about gender, about human rights, about climate change, about renewable energy, about those issues. So I guess, back to your uh, comments, social economy and new economy, definitely a, a, a future for Canada. And, and I just wanna say, the other, yeah, there is, your point is also well taken because the gender lens is is an important it's output very, from a lot of this work on, on the, in the developing yeah. country context. And that's in part why the UN and the ILO uh, 
see such hope in right. the co-op model yeah. right, in and terms of fulfilling the sustainable development goals. Yeah, and I. I feel I feel uh, sorry because because my perspective is economic perspective. I didn't have opportunity to talk about the achievements by CDF. Uh, one project in uh, by CDF in Colombia was in rural area, uh, kind of uh, supporting the coffee producers. Uh, that projects that products were targeting women. So pr before, uh, so my colleague uh, described at the at the beginning of the project. When they go to, when they went to the that community, the women there, they, they dare to speak anything. They feel so afraid and shy to talk with men, because this is something they sh they, they are not supposed to do. But now they are the main profit, like uh, income or source of the family. They are so confident. They run their own co-op. And by the way, co-ops managed as well as other business managed by women have a higher, much higher successful rate than co-ops managed by men. So, yeah, just uh, something related to gender. No offense to, to men <laughs> fellows. <laughs> one, one thing that I do is, uh, is I um, make loans through Kiva. I, there's other outfits that do that, but I make Kiva loans. And they, they um, the ones that I'm really fond of are, are uh, collectives female mm -hmm. and male collectives but we're just yeah. both genders together in, in sort of a collective and, and uh, um, they're, they're, I'd be interested to look at those repayment mm -hmm. levels but I, mm -hmm. I get the sense they're quite high in those situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, didn't mind that data. Yeah. I have one more question. So okay. I, I can take it all night, but I, I'll, I'll let everyone off after this. <laughs> the, uh, what, one thing that strikes me is, um, you know, if you think back to Saskatchewan, I know the credit union system. That's that's my, as you know, that's where my yeah. interests have been historically. And um, you look at the credit union system development in Saskatchewan, and they had a lot of government support, right? Not just not just that there were favorable tax measures, right? They weren't taxed for a long time. Yeah. Uh, in fact, in, during their infancy, there were no, they were not taxed at all until like 72, right? So they had, a, they had a long run to catch up to the, so they had favorable tax, they had favorable government regulatory structures, they had, they had, they had and they were also, a lot of the people in the credit system were, were politically involved. And yeah. so I'm wondering, so there was, they were part of a larger ecosystem. It wasn't just setting up a credit union, it wasn't just setting up a co-op, they were yeah. part of a larger movement. Um, and I think that's true in a lot of cases. So do you, when you work with these developing countries and the people who are setting up co-ops, how do you navigate that? Or how do you work with the people to help them understand that um, as much as they might try to set up a co-op, if they don't have a favorable policy environment, um, and being in the policy school, this is something where yeah. a lot of weight on. What, what, does, that, does that enter into the conversation at all? Or is that too risky? Because if you push them into the political space, then you would risk politicizing the co-op. They, they already did. They already. Uh, one country, I'm record, uh, so I'm recording, so I shouldn't <laughs> mention the name of the country. <laughs> they said co-ops are mainly a way to 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 interfere to 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 uh, to uh, control the people. I shouldn't use the control, but kind of a, 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 a affect the voting and stuff by by founding the co-ops. Government has. Uh, local connections with the local people and they can influence uh, they can put their influence to the local communities so that uh, the voting can be you know uh, can favor them so even in democratic control uh, in demo uh, democratic countries um, we can we can say the co-ops could be democratic sometimes in democratic uh, democratic countries co-op could be a tool for governance to get more votes um, yeah, I don't know whether. No, that's good. That's good. And and I, I totally support it. So it also get back to the previous questions about the social values of co-ops. But if you go just go through this economic and uh, an, an analytical uh, approach, the government shouldn't step in subsidizing uh, the co-ops because it's a market competition, right? You you like the I I read something about um, the the uh, the housing co-ops in Saskatchewan are. Uh, going against the, the, the government's uh, policy of uh, re, re, uh, like, uh, canceling the subsidy, subsidy. Mm -hmm. from uh, economics, I shouldn't say that, but I, I think subsidy in any terms 
it's not good in an economic perspective. However, if you think about it as social policy, you are, you, you are redistributing the, the tax to people who need support as a kind of a you know, social policy rather than economic policy. That makes sense because those people are living in housing co-ops, they, they can't afford uh, the, the, the rents uh, if they rent some, other, uh, rent some houses from other sources. They need solidarity. They need, they, they, uh, need a, a, a good uh, living uh, condition. In that sense, subsidy is definitely uh, reasonable. So I mean, this is also why uh, this is also why uh, policy uh, public policy making so hard, because there are so many perspectives, especially economic perspective. Uh, so the joke about economists is that um, the president get into the Oval Office and ask uh, uh, you know, economist A, what do you think about the economy? The economy said said you know we. we probably will get into the depression, so get the financial tools and uh, the, you know, uh, the financial policies ready for the depression. And the economy B said, we are in a very good condition, you know, the prosperous market is, uh, is, is in front of us, so, so keep the interest rate low, and uh, keep the interest rate high and stuff. So two economists at the same time in the, in the same office have two exactly opposite opinions. Then when it comes to Opinions from different perspectives, uh, it's really complicated. Uh, it's really complicated to get a one unified uh, solution. Well, thank you so much for, for this talk, Sian. Thank you. I really appreciate you making your way here. And thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.